action and to help advance transformative policies that center and serve marginalized communities. We really wanted to be able to bring something to our community that talks about all of the ballot measures that are up for this election and that really stresses the importance of why this election is so critical. Um, a couple themes that have surfaced from last week's convening was just ensuring that we vote all the way down the ballot, that we know exactly what each measure is talking about and what each measure means for us and our communities. And so we're going to talk also a little bit about what the East Bay Anti-Displacement Collective is. Um, we're hosting this convening for you all as just a member of our communities to ensure that we have built the adequate power that we need for November. All right, and so I'm gonna pass this over to Shamari Carter, who's going to talk a little bit about what the East Bay Anti-Displacement Collective is. Shamari? Uh, thank you, Ndidi. Welcome everyone on behalf of the uh, East Bay Anti-Displacement Collective. I'm Shamari Carter with a card. Um, the, the East Bay Anti-Displacement uh, Collective, as we call it, EBAD, is committed to the advancement of anti-displacement strategies that center low-income, marginalized, and historically disinvested communities to remain, live, and thrive in Alameda County. Our current group members are the Brotherhood of Elders Network, Eastside Arts Alliance, the East Oakland Collective, occur in the Unity Council. And once again, we thank you all for being here with us, uh, enjoy. Thank you, Brother Shamari. Um, and we just wanted to also be able to go over a few of our core tenants. Um, first and foremost, we wanna keep people housed and we're committed to ensuring that Alameda County is a welcoming place where our longtime residents can thrive and remain. Um, we're deeply invested in building community power for our communities and we intend to elevate and accelerate community efforts that build infrastructure, institutions, and political power. Our third tenant is improve quality of life. And we believe that we must center the lived experiences of the most marginalized residents and advance transformative solutions that reduce disparate impacts. And our last tenant is stopping cultural displacement. We seek to keep and preserve the uniquely East Bay cultural practices that ground us and hold us in place and make the East Bay a place where everyone is thriving. All right, we're gonna go over our summit overview for today. And so we are in the midst of our opening session right now. And our first session for today will be a Proposition 16 teach-in with Dejan Grace. Our second session today will be a Proposition 15 teach-in with Liz Souk. We'll have a voter rights training um, with Elisa Victory, which was absolutely amazing um, from last week. We will also have a Proposition 20 teach-in with Yoel. And so um, some of our presenters from last week uh, wanted to come back and uh, deliver their presentations again because they were just so impactful for our community. Um, I'll let you know for the voting rights training, it is everything you ever needed to know about your mail-in ballots and you all are able to ask any questions of all of our presenters. And so we're excited to have a good and robust discussion with everyone. All right, so we're going to go through an overview of our presenters for today. Our first presenter for today will be Dijon Grace. They'll be doing our Proposition 16 teach-in. And Dijon Grace is the 2019-2020 Economic Equity Fellow for the Greenlining Institute. Greenlining is a racial and economic justice policy and research institute that envisions a nation where communities of color thrive and race is never a barrier to economic opportunity. They are the solution to redlining by advancing economic opportunity and empowerment for people of color through advocacy, community and coalition building, research and leadership development. On the economic equity team, Dijon works with financial institutions, policymakers and POC led community organizations to both expand pre-existing and create new avenues of wealth building opportunities for communities of color. 
Thank you, Dejan. Our next presenter for today will be Liz Souk, and they will be doing our Proposition 15 teach-in. Liz Souk grew up in the Bay Area with deep roots in Deep East Oakland. She has a 25 plus year career in various nonprofit and grassroots organizations in the Bay Area, such as the Korean Community Center of the East Bay, Eastside Arts Alliance, and SEIU USWW. Currently, she is the political director at Oakland Rising and Oakland Rising Action, and sits as the president of the board of directors for the Bay Area Parent Leadership Action Network, also known as PLAN. She is committed to social, racial, and environmental justice for indigenous, black, and brown communities, and passing on these values to her two children, whom you'll often see by her side during meetings and during campaigns. She brings a micro to global lens in her coordination, strategy, and politics, and she enjoys hiking, camping, creating and sharing herbal remedies, writing poetry and photography. Most of all, as a connector and protector, Liz enjoys cooking and feeding people while imagining a new world rooted in love, liberation, peace and justice. Our next presenter is returning from last week and that is Elisa Victory who will be hosting our Know Your Voting Rights training Elisa is an Oakland native with a long record of community organizing and popular education. Elisa is a graduate of UC San Diego with a BA in Ethnic Studies with honors and a minor in African, African American Studies. Elisa is a licensed attorney working in civil rights with the ACLU of Northern California and a labor rights attorney with Communication Workers of America, Local 9415. Elisa also serves as the Community Programs Director for the Statewide African Black Coalition, headquartered in Oakland, and is an advisory board member for the newly created East Bay Urban Alliance. In her spare time, Elisa enjoys spending time with her dogs and making art. Also returning from last week is Yoel Hailey, and they will be hosting our Proposition 20 teach-in. Yoel Hailey is a criminal justice program manager with the ACLU of Northern California. In this capacity, he manages a statewide network of local organizations in 11 of the largest California counties to hold elected district attorneys accountable and to end mass incarceration. Yoel grew up in Asmara, Eritrea and moved to California in 2006. He attended the University of California, Santa Barbara, as an undergraduate where he received his degrees in Black Studies and Political Science in 2013. There he helped initiate and negotiate Black student demands to the campus chancellor that resulted in more than $3.7 million in immediate and committed funding for the recruitment and retention of Black students, staff, and faculty. As the political director of the African Black Coalition, a statewide Black youth organization, Yoel helped lead campaigns that resulted in the University of California divesting all of its nearly $30 million in holdings from the private prison system and terminating $475 million in contracts with Wells Fargo. Yoel received his master's degree in public policy from the Goldman School of Public Policy at UC Berkeley in May 2016. These are our wonderful presenters today. We are so happy um, that we have some returning ones and that we have some new ones for today. And so I am going to hand it over to Deshaun Grace, who will help us with our session one for Proposition 16. We'll do a little sharing of our screens again. So Dejan, whenever you're ready, let me get our screen back up. I'm sorry, I'm muted. I apologize. Can you hear me? Perfect. Um, you are sharing the screen, correct? Yes, I'm pulling it up. Yes, thank you. I love the art, by the way. Ah, Proposition 16. Perfect. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. As Ndidi gracefully mentioned earlier, my name is Dejan Grace, and I have the distinct pleasure of serving you all for today's Proposition 16 teaching. Excuse me. Uh, justice is on the ballot, ladies and gentlemen. And it looks like it looks a lot like Proposition 16, which will ensure equal opportunity for all and reinstate affirmative action. 
uh, as society builds a new system that serves us all in an equitable and just way, this upcoming election is that much more monumental to the movement. And to kick things off, let's walk through a little context. Next slide, please. Starting with affirmative action. What is affirmative action? Affirmative action is the attempt to promote equal opportunity for people who continue to face educational, economic, and institutional barriers to achieving success. Historically, women, Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and Asian American people have faced these barriers the most. Current laws in California prevent our elected leaders from taking aimed action to fight discrimination. And to counteract this discrimination, affirmative action policies attempt to give everyone a fair shot at success and really livelihood. Now let's, let's take a second and picture this. What would your life be like if you were denied uh, an opportunity to go to a good school with the resources you needed to achieve your dreams or to provide for your family? What would your life be like if you were denied that job you were really counting on just to be able to put food in your child's stomach, let alone yours, or to keep the lights on? What would your life be like if the livelihood of your business depended on that public contract? Instead of rejoicing, you have to tell your staff <laughs> that they will have to find another way to provide for their families. Or you have to convince your child whose stomach is growling intensely that everything will be okay and to go to sleep so that the hunger goes away. Or you have to look in the mirror and cope with the fact that systemic discrimination canceled your dreams. Now, this may be a hypothetical situation and not your reality, but I guarantee it is the reality for many in communities of color. Listen, we have a once in a generation opportunity to make the systemic changes that can help ensure life is more sweet than it is sour for our women, women of color, black communities, Latinx communities, indigenous communities, and Asian American communities. Next slide, please. Did you know equal opportunity policies were some of the early demands of the black community, which were adopted by Kennedy, the Kennedy administration to actively ensure that federal hiring and employment practices were free of racial bias. In fact, black activists pushed uh, President Kennedy to pass the first affirmative action executive order, which paved the way for the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and much more. To be transparent, it is uh, it's a shame that we even had to push in the first place, but we'll save that to you for another time. Um, and currently, only nine states have a ban on affirmative action, and California is obviously one of those nine. Uh, communities of color in, place like, in places like Atlanta are able to flourish economically because they don't have this ban and chose instead to legalize equal opportunity. Similarly, Proposition 16 does just that. It legalizes opportunity. Next slide, please. So what would Proposition 16 do? It would, one, reinstate affirmative action programs. It would also align California with 41 other states who are already doing this, legalizing equal opportunity. Um, it would help actualize diversity and inclusion by allowing California to hire a diverse workforce that is reflective of our beautifully multi-ethnic population. And lastly, with your support, once it passes in November, uh, California can take into consideration the systemic challenges unique to each community of color when making decisions about government contracts, education, and hiring. Now, at this moment, I'd like to read a quote that spoke to me by Dr. Martin Luther King in his 1964 Nobel Peace Prize address. The quote is, uh, the rich nations must use their vast resources of wealth to develop the underdeveloped, school the unschooled, and feed the unfed. Ultimately, a great nation is a compassionate nation. No individual or nation can be great if it does not have the concern for the least of these. Again, we have a once in a lifetime, a once in a generation opportunity to make some changes and address this. Next slide, please. Thank you. 
Now, at this point, you may be asking yourselves, what do equal opportunity programs look like? It looks like fighting wage discrimination, ensuring women are fairly considered for advancements and promotions at work, closing the leadership gap, and, uh, which will help close the wage gap. It looks like uh, thriving women and people of color owned businesses, ensuring businesses can compete on a level playing field and women and people of color owned businesses stop losing $1.1 billion every year in lost contracts. It looks like investment opportunities in K through 12 education, STEM education for girls, college and career counseling for high school students who are most in need to close racial equity gaps. And it looks like equity in higher education, expanding resources for, to students to help them reach their full potential and grow our population of diverse professionals to serve our communities. It also looks like enforcing non-discrimination policies setting goals for diversity, collecting and analyzing data on diversity, uh, examining how important decisions such as hiring and promotion of employees, the admission of students, and the awarding of contracts might be biased and looking for ways to overcome such bias. It also looks like uh, providing mentorship and other resources for members of underrepresented groups and establishing staff positions or working groups dedicated to strengthening equal opportunity efforts. Now, employers encourage equal opportunity by taking steps to ensure that people of color and women see job openings for which they are qualified. And then by providing mentoring, uh, especially in the fields that have been traditionally populated by white men, such as science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, referred to also as STEM, as well as construction. Agencies that award public contracts support equal opportunity by enabling businesses owned by people of color and women to work with prime contractors and or to grow to become prime contractors, as well as by providing financial assistance, such as help with loans and bonding and insurance. Next slide, please. Now, we're going to watch a quick video, which offers a, a brief history of California and equal opportunity. Let's take a look. Did you help us out? Pretty please. Yes. Thank you. wages, good jobs, and quality schools. But the truth is, a wealthy few are overrepresented in positions of power. While many Californians are discriminated against because of what they look like or where they're from, women do the same work as men, but are paid 80 cents for every dollar. Women of color and single moms are paid even less. And while small businesses are the backbone of our economy, nearly all government contracts are awarded to large companies run by older white men. Despite their hard work, women and people of color are not given the same opportunities. Prop 16 would give everyone a fair shot at rising to the top. We could close the wage gap by making sure women and people of color are employed and promoted fairly. We could ensure that government contracts are equitably awarded and that everyone has access to a quality public education. We are in a historic moment as we fight for racial justice and to protect those hit hardest by COVID-19. Together, we can take a stand against discrimination and reshape our systems so all Californians have the opportunity to thrive. Brilliant thinkers believe that open... I appreciate you catching that. Thank you, Indy. Uh, now let's take a, a, a deeper dive on equal opportunity and affirmative action. Once the slide back up. Oh, okay. please, uh, at home, give a hand for Ndidi for doing this amazing moderating and facilitation. I really appreciate this.
Sorry, y'all. Give me a second to get our screen share back up. Take the time. And then do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's perfect. Uh, yeah. So now let's let's take a little deeper dive on equal opportunity and affirmative action. Starting with this slide here of investing in women. Now, in uh, when states practice affirmative action, women can earn higher wages, get promoted more, and start lucrative careers at a higher rate. Proposition 16 would help fight gender discrimination and improve equal opportunity for all Californian women. In fighting wage discrimination, Prop 16 will help us start to close the wage gap where women make just 80 cents on the dollar and Latinas make just 41. In standing up for women businesses, California is home to the greatest number of women-owned businesses in the nation with about 1.55 million. Uh, yet women-owned businesses still grow at a slower rate and earn less revenue than male-owned firms. Proposition 16 can help turn the tide by increasing investment in women uh, entrepreneurs and in improving access to well-paying jobs and promotions. Women sit on just 15% of corporate boards and are just 33% of tenured faculty in the UC system. Proposition 16 can help, uh, can improve women's access to promotions uh, to lead their companies and organizations into the future. Now this hits home for me, especially because I grew up in a single parent household. In fact, 58% of black families in Oakland, California, where I was born and raised, um, are headed by single mothers. And 34% 34, 34 of those mothers live in poverty. Now, honestly, I take that last statistic with a grain of salt, given the fact that women still earn less, uh, less per dollar than men uh, due to the wage gap. And for uh, black women in particular, which I'm black, my mother's black, uh, it's about 60% on the dollar. Couple that with the fact that across the nation, about 65% of black families are single parent households, largely due to multifaceted forms of those unique systemic challenges we mentioned earlier, including Ronald Reagan's uh, declaration of war on drugs during a time when illegal drug use was uh, on a decline in 1982. Credit to Michelle Alexander, the new Jim Crow for that fact. Um, in addition to mass incarceration and California's three strike laws in 1960, 1994. Uh, I mention all that because even though data reports that 34% of single mothers in Oakland are living in poverty, we cannot forget that one, most folks in general are making less than living wage, let alone have the ability to survive a $400 emergency. And second, it is incredibly and horrifically difficult to support a family on a single parent's income, especially one from a community this country has discriminated against, even so that all the data and studies speak to this reality. So shout out to all the single mothers out there, the superheroes of the families, holding it down and doing the best to raise their children to have a life they were denied themselves due to discrimination laws and systems designed to serve the rich and, the, and powerful. Uh, shout out to my mom, granny, and my aunts. I, I love y'all. <laughs> and uh, for this reason, I am that much more excited for Proposition 16 and this opportunity to legalize, uh, or this opportunity to legalize equal opportunity this upcoming November election. Next slide, please. Education for all. Now, our K through 12 schools are funded through the local control funding formula, which is weighted to better support historically marginalized groups. Uh, the K through 12 formula focuses on providing districts with additional funding to meet the needs of English learners, foster youth, and low-income students. Like the groups already recognized under our funding framework, 
Prop 16 would allow to add groups by race to account for the heightened levels of resources and focused attention needed to support Latinx, Black, and Native American students. For example, data shows approximately 90,000 90, African American students cannot generate additional funds to meet their unique needs. Prop 16 will allow us to offer the support to address this. Additionally, Proposition 16 would allow, will remove the potential lawsuits that schools currently face in implementing aimed programs, practices, and policies to support the specific needs of students based on their gender or ethnic group. It would permit schools to implement aimed outreach, tutoring, and support services necessary to retain and graduate specific student groups. For example, using their funding to provide programs for girls and women of color in STEM, or setting explicit goals to bolster the academic success of specific students of color. Also, Prop 16 will facilitate the growth of diversity in our teacher workforce. Several research studies show that students of color benefit from having teachers who look like them, and these benefits extend to white students as well. Yet, California's teacher, California's teacher workforce does not reflect the students in our K-12 education system. The student body is more than 75% of students of color, but the teacher workforce is 65% white. Prop 16 will permit teacher prep programs and districts to actively set recruitment goals that focus on diversifying the teacher's workforce and also allow for grants and scholarships to incentivize teachers of color to enter and stay in the profession. For all my teachers of colors out there, I wanna give a special thanks. Uh, representation matters and our kids need you. Next slide, please. In higher education, let's be very, very clear. Prop 16 will not reinstate quotas. In fact, quotas were declared unconstitutional in 1978, two decades before Prop 209 ever went into effect. And for decades, California have been denied, Californians have been denied equal economic and educational opportunities because of their race, ethnicity, and or gender. Black and Latinx students in California's 12th grade classes have historically and continue to be underrepresented in enrollment relative to the corresponding UC freshman class. Most recently in 2018 through 2019, 53% of California 12th grade students were Latinx and 6% were Black. However, only 25% of Latinx and 4% Black students were represented in the enrolled 2019 UC fall freshman class. Now, despite over 20 years of income-focused programs and diversity initiatives, such as uh, creation of Early Academic Outreach Program, also known as EAOP, the Math Engineering Science Achievement, MESA program, and Puente Project, the UC system still has work to do to improve diversity and representation. In 2017 through 2018, the number of high school students served in the UC's largest program, EAOP, uh, was nearly 61,000 students. In MESA, MESA served nearly 16,000 and Puente supported nearly 6,000 students. And also nearly 12K, 12,000 community college students in total were supported as well. However, all of these numbers are relatively small when considering the size of our K through 12 um, and our community college system. We need to improve the reach to these programs and allow for the aimed outreach and recruitment of student ethnic groups underrepresented at our most selective university and the largest higher education system in, our, in the world, our California community colleges. Now, similar to K through 12, community colleges are fund, funded through formulas that are weighted to better support historically marginalized groups. The community college formula provides additional funding for students eligible for financial aid and undocumented students. Like the groups already recognized under our framework, or under yeah our funding framework, uh, Proposition 16 would allow us to add groups by ethnicity to account for the heightened levels of resources and focused attention needed to support Latinx, Black, and Native American students. Again, Proposition 16 will permit colleges to fund and implement aimed outreach, tutoring, and support services necessary to retain and graduate specific student groups. Next slide, please. Thank you. Public contracting and affirmative action. 
Now, California's dynamic economy should benefit everyone. Um, instead, women and the minority-owned businesses lose $1.1 billion a year. Also, contracts awarded to minority and women-owned businesses have dropped 70, dropped 79 percent when contracting was made race and gender neutral. Prop 16 will change that, uh, allowing agencies to conduct key disparity studies, as well as restoring local government's ability to make targeted investments that empower women and minority-owned firms. Now, research in this area found that people of color-owned businesses received only 57 percent of the contract dollars that might be expected in a non-discriminatory environment while women-owned businesses received only 29%. That is a problem. Next one, please. Employment and affirmative action. California should have a workforce that mirrors our diversity. Instead, white men are overrepresented in leadership, keeping women and people of color from climbing the ladder, and individuals cannot fix enormous discriminatory hiring or pay gaps on their own, like LA, Los Angeles, where women city employees are paid just 76 cents on a dollar, and men also outnumber them two to one. Prop 16 will change that by ensuring women have equal access to raises and promotions, and also allowing the state and cities to use targeted outreach to engage more job candidates who are women and people of color. Next slide, please. So, why now? First, polling has been conducted over several years and recently a poll in the summer of 2019 showed a path to victory in 2020. Second, after the campaign launched in March, uh, the impacts of COVID-19 and protests after the murder of Mr. George Floyd, may so rest in peace, underscored the ugly reality of things and how urgently we need to build a more equitable nation. California, let's lead the way here. And third, the November 2020 electorate will be vast, diverse, and very eager to vote for change. Again, ladies and gentlemen, justice is on the ballot this November, and we have a once in a generation opportunity to make one of the systemic policy changes we need uh, to legalize equal opportunity. Next slide, please. Here are the essential takeaways. If there's anything we hope to learn from today, is that Proposition 16 is a bill that provides equal opportunity for all. It expands equal opportunity to all Californians, increasing access to fair wages, good jobs, and quality schools for everyone. It fights wage discrimination and systemic barriers by opening up opportunities for women and people of color. And by passing Proposition 16, we can live up to our California values and build a stronger community where everyone has the resources they need to thrive. Next slide, please. Now look, there have been a lot of false narratives that have been circulating regarding the impact of affirmative action on the Asian community, uh, Asian American community, excuse me. Uh, let's take the time to shed light and clear this up. Affirmative action is a solution that helps everybody, including the Asian American community. One, Studies show that universities that practice affirmative action see greater gains in Asian American enrollment. Two, Asian American owned businesses lose money on public contracts, just like, or just, yeah, just like every other minority owned business. Third, just like every Californian, Asian Americans want teachers who look like them, more principals, more university presidents, first responders, et cetera. Current law prevents that. And lastly, Racial quotas were deemed unconstitutional by the Supreme Court in 1971. As such, they will never be put in place. Next slide, please. Now, I, I don't intend to spend too much time here. I just want to paint a picture of who the opposition is. So who is the opposition? Our opposition is a small coalition led by and financed, led and financed by uh, Republican donors and Trump sympathizers. Ward Connerly and Gail Harriet are longtime opponents of affirmative action who proudly support and donate to Trump. They use fear mongering, um, misinformation, and racial division as their main tactics. So, our main goal, our, our campaign goal, is to increase education around affirmative action, uh, such as today, 
and stop the spread of misinformation that these groups are disseminating. Next slide, please. Want to know what you can do? Here is exactly how you can support Prop 16. You can sign up uh, for a text bank training, which the next three are September 16th, uh, 6 to 7 p.m., September 23rd, 6 to 7 p.m., and September 30th, 6 to 7 p.m. Um, and I will drop the, the link in the chat later. Um, you can also join our social media team, share, repost, like, uh, at yes on Prop 16. Again, that handle is yes on Prop 16. And lastly, but not least, you can donate on our website. It is uh, vote yes on prop 16.org. Again, that is vote yes on prop 16.org. Please donate. And next slide, please. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for supporting equality of opportunity in California. And remember, justice is on the ballot, ladies and gentlemen. And it looks a lot like Prop 16. I will place my contact information in the chat for any follow ups. Also, as a heads up, please be on the lookout for uh, the Green Line Institute to host a proposition town hall on October 7th, which is a Thursday. We'll cover topics such as Prop 16 and more. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions from our audience? And so if Davina, our tech support, wouldn't mind helping me field some questions, that would be awesome. Can I drop the link? Really yes, please do. All right, so I guess we'll give it a little more time um, for some questions. Sorry, drop in chat. My computer internet is acting up. Welcome to COVID life. Work from home. All right. Um, so I have a question. Um, Dejan, thank you for going through all of this wonderful um, information and providing a little bit more context. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of bring up, you know, that there's a lot of our students in the University of California system. And that's one of the main like leaders around higher education. And just, I'm wondering, are there any impacts um, for our black faculty in terms of getting tenured and remaining um, just because of my experience uh, my favorite teacher uh, was unable to kind of get across that wage gap and that promotion gap that exists and so they went for greener pastures um, and moved to texas and accepted a tenure track you know professorship somewhere else because they were unable to get it in their home state of california mm -hmm at the school that they got their degrees from. Mm -hmm. You know what, uh, it, it definitely will, it definitely will. Again, the, the main component of Proposition 16 is uh, to uh, allow for uh, consideration on the systemic challenges that we've all faced, especially in, in as it relates to hiring. So mm -hmm. um, when you ask whether or not it will have an impact on someone's ability or eligibility uh, or consideration <laughs> in regards to, um, uh, being tenured at the UC system, they definitely will. I don't know the intricacies of it uh, because I, I, I can't speak to it at this moment, but I would love to follow up and I would love to hear what you think about it. Yeah, I think, I hope, I think it will support um, some of our um, doctorates who are trying to really find um, a comfortable and, and a space that's due um to them because i feel like there's you know the same disparate impacts and discrimination exists um and i personally have a lot of friends who are going into um their phd programs or leaving their phd programs and are just um very excited to teach but are kind of having an understanding where 
they may not, you know, be able to teach for, you know, the rest of their life and in a discipline that they've committed their life to. And so for me, I really just hope that some of our students are impacted in the same ways that I was because this was my absolute favorite professor who, uh, you know, even got me into like finishing uh, college and um, they're part of one of the reasons that I came to the Bay Area. And so um, just the impact that this one person had on me and knowing that I'm coming into contact with um, students of color who can't benefit from that same um, tutelage is really uh, disheartening. And um, it just really lends to my experience as a graduate of a, of a UC um, and just understanding that like my UC, and I said this last week, my UC had over 30,000 students um, who were attending, but there was 865 black students. And so um, out of 30,000, we were about two, almost 3%. And that's very common across the UC system. There is only one school that um, trends higher than 10% in terms of the black um, population of students. And so for me, this is like absolutely something wonderful and beautiful to see happening and that I never thought we were gonna have this opportunity to do. Yeah, I'm happy you actually spoke to that. Um, I, so I, I graduated from UC Berkeley and shout out to, uh, I started, saw that someone kind of also was a graduate of UC Berkeley and Go Bears. Um, I recognize that UC Berkeley has a very, very good teachers within the African-American studies department and just African-American teachers uh, on the campus. I would love to see, you know, more incentives and our support to help, um, to help them uh, secure tenor positions and just that security and peace of mind, right? Definitely that security and peace of mind. And um, I know that just in my experience going through educational system uh, in Oakland in particular, I didn't see many teachers at, at K through 12 as well. I didn't see many black teachers. And um, yet some of my favorite teachers were African-American and black and just that ability to relate and to understand exactly what was going on at home and be able to how to, to um, speak to those things in a way that was productive, as opposed to uh, you know penalizing the student. We know we all know the school school to prison pipeline, but um, I think all those things could be the impact of a school to prison pipeline could be reduced through having that representation, which again, Prop 16 allows for the support and incentives for uh, the teachers to uh, again stay stay in the programs, to complete the programs, stay in the programs, and then to to have the impact that we want on our week. Yeah. Yes. And so we had a, a question in our Q&A box and one of our attendees, marvelous attendees is asking, what does investment look like for women of color in the family child care field through Prop 16? What does investment look like? So when it comes to the uh, power in which the government has or in local space and public spaces to uh, again provide aimed resources it looks like one being able to identify exactly where the gaps are which where the lack of support is and then to uh, tailor the available resources that the government has um, towards, towards uh, the, our, our women um, I can't really speak to the specific oh my camera went off Um, I can't really speak to the specifics, like the nitty gritty of it at this moment, um, but I, I do know in general, it, it looks like uh, actually conducting a study and being able to identify what, where the gaps are and then um, collectively um, figuring out what resources would uh, fill in those gaps and uh, implement them. But in the past, we, we haven't been able to do such a thing. Um, so I could understand where in which it's kind of hard to imagine because uh, some of us have seen it you know, thus far. But Prop 209, which I didn't, I didn't really mention too much of, uh, but that, that prop in particular has prevented us to uh, provide um, um, tailored support, which again, uh, in any situation where you're providing a solution, it's important to uh, make it considerable of the unique dynamics of that particular population community. So as again, it comes to uh, the women of color, our women is important to 
conduct the study, which again, uh, 209 prevent us from even doing in the first place to identify those things um, and then to send the resources there. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Yes. And so for me, I do see that there is a um, connection because our child care system right now is um, absolutely depleted and we're going to have to rise like a phoenix from the ashes in terms of our child care system um, right. during this time. And so, you know, Prop 16 will help um, close things like the wage gap and bring the glass ceiling lower so we can shatter through. Um, but in terms of child care, I think it's going to take a particular and comprehensive set of, of changes and reforms and innovations around how we do child care, especially given COVID-19. And so I think that that's something um, that maybe our next presenter, Liz, um, can speak to because of their work in this field and also just um, speaking on child care and, and raising strong children. Liz is so awesome with that. Um, and her children are right by her side in the organizing <laughs> with us. So it's really beautiful to see. Um, do we have any more questions for Deshaun um, before we move forward to our next teach in? And so we'll give folks a little bit of time to manage the tech. Can I say that I would love to see funding or subsidies that um, are provided to uh, our women of color? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I would, I would love to see that. Just as if we could make uh, the support systems that we need as uh, accessible as possible, I think that is a key. Uh, yeah, for us to have the space that we need. Absolutely. Um, and just, you know, some of the crazy stuff that I've been reading in the news about um, in other states, some folks, you know, are working from home, but right. you're getting weird letters from their employer around, you can't take care of your kids during um, any work hours. And so you still have to get childcare, but childcare centers are closed due to COVID. So, you know, you're really a rock in a hard place. And so I'm happy that, you know, we have a not as difficult set of um, restrictions in California and that we're able to have a little bit more flexibility. However, there's a lot that needs to be done for our child care system and then, you know, policy that needs to be to supplement um, Prop 16 if our, our women and our women of color are going to be working more robustly and really getting their due um, and getting their due. All right. Thank you, Dejan. This was wonderful. All of our slides will be available after the fact. And so I'm going to pass it over to Liz for our next session um, on Proposition 15. Liz is amazing um, and has been uh. all around the, the organizing community in the East Bay. So I am just super excited to hear from you um, and, and see you in person. Um, this is the first Yay. time I've seen Liz. Um, since our quarantine started. So this is very special for me. Take it away. Thank you. Am I able to share my screen? Yes, no. ma'am. Okay. Um, and if Davina could make sure that Liz is a co-host. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna Stop your screen and I'm going to share mine. Yay! And yay, it worked! Thank you. That was so easy. Um, oh, I didn't mean to push share. Of course, when I hopped on, my internet went out really fast. And um, so, all right, so here I am. So, how did we get here basically? Why is Prop 15, why is Prop 15 so important to us? Um, because, um, you know, during the 1970s, uh, let me actually take a further step back. Um, I'm gonna let you all absorb everything that's on the screen as you listen. I'm sure many of you all know some of this history, but I wanted to ground us in that history. Um, and, 
um, I realized that I didn't really introduce myself. So my name is Liz Chuck. I'm the um, I'm the political director for Oakland Rising, Oakland Rising Action. Uh, we've been around for uh, 15 years or 12 years. Um, and Oakland Rising is a collaborative of nine organizations in the Bay um, and mostly doing work in Oakland, but um, are considering how we might expand um, further out into Alameda County. And uh, these organizations um, are from like Ella Baker Center, Casa uh, Husa Just Cause, Mujeres Unidas y Activas, Courage, um, eBase, um, PVO, uh, Parent Voices Oakland, uh, St. Mary's Center, and um, Bend the Arc. And so these are our nine collaborative organizations and we come together and do work on civic engagement and civic um, education and political education to folks in the flatlands in marginalized communities, particularly black and brown communities um, in the flatlands of Oakland. And so we've been working on Prop 15 schools and communities first for a few years now. Uh, we were um, we were are part of a statewide coalition called California Calls and um, Million Voter Project that has been working on uh, rescinding Prop 13 and the effects of Prop 13 for over 40 years now. And um, so, if we look back at Prop 13, like how it how we got to this place, um, prior to that, we um, saw a huge influx of black folks migrating from the south to California. We also saw an increase of US um, intervention, um, military intervention and government intervention in Central and South America, as well as in Asia. So we saw the Korean War, we saw the Vietnam War. Uh, we uh, had this huge influx of immigration to California um, from both, again, like I said, from the south uh, from the global south, from our U.S. south, and then from and then coming into our cities, and we saw a huge flight of white folks leaving, and we saw an establishment of suburban areas, and um, in that came racism, right? It's like established in our country. It's been here for quite a long time. And so um, the way that that worked was that white folks were moving out to the suburbs like Walnut Creek, you know, um, Fremont, establishing these suburban cities and we're saying we're not going to pay our property tax to go towards um, helping and uh, funding schools and services for folks of color and for um, those living in the city. And uh, it moved property tax from being assessed locally to being um, assessed at the state level. And so uh, we began to see as a, uh, as a result of that, um, a decrease of funding and services um, across the state. Um, and, you know, the people who benefited from this the most actually were corporations, the wealthiest of them and the white majority. Um, for example, Chevron cost California in its assessed property tax $100 million, and to Contra Costa County alone, $3.1 million, $3 million to $3.5 million. And the way they do this is that in 1978, it basically froze the property assessment um, at that rate. Um, so in 19, if you owned a property in 1978, the, the assessed value of your home, that's what you're paying your taxes on till this day. Um, the only time that that assessment changes is when ownership changes. And so this is why we see across California, like, you know, Walmart, that's why they, they buy their properties and then they don't sell them because they're just, they're still paying taxes on um, really low assessed value. That's why there's so many vacant lots in Oakland, um, because um, that's another way that folks who own that lot, um, they don't pay taxes, um, very high taxes on them. So when, they, um, when they're waiting for the property value to increase, and so you're starting to see more and more developments on those uh, vacant lots, but there's still, uh, there's no real uh, cost to the owners of those lots. Um, and so what did, what did that do? 
at the same time that we saw a, a disinvestment in our communities, we saw an investment, um, increased investment in prisons. And so what did that lead to? We led to homelessness and gentrification. It led to crumbling infrastructures like our infamous potholes. Um, it also um, increased, um, it decreased our investment in healthcare. So this all created an, a tremendous amount of insecurity and poverty in our communities. And we then began to see an increase in um, investment in prisons and that created um, prison pipelines, right? So from schools to prisons, from the streets to prisons, from our communities to prisons. Um, and we now have a burgeoning prison system. And because there is no, um, there's no, um, because corporations are um, benefiting so much by this property tax, we are also beginning to see this increase in our environmental racism, right? So, for example, a couple of weeks ago, just before we headed into fire season, Chevron um, had a had to release um, gas into the air, um, and uh, they had a fire. So, then all the folks in Richmond um, had to deal with that, and folks like our folks at APEN, Asian Pacific Environmental Network, and Communities for a Better Environment have been working really hard against Chevron and, and still they continue to benefit from this. So what happens as a result of that? We have a shift in burden from the state to the working class, to our people, because we now have crumbling infrastructure. So if you've been driving around Oakland, you'll notice that they've been doing a lot of um, infrastructure projects like paving our roads. We're paying a bond on that. It's not for free, it's not coming from the state, it's local property taxes that um, we're having to pay on those. We're seeing increase in community college fees when, when at one time it was free, right, which allowed many of our working class and poor folks to be able to move um, and, and, and shift out of, out of those um, categories and move their families into um, relative wealth. Um, and then you have um, increase in sales tax. You know, uh, we are, Oakland Rising is um, going to be um, endorsing Measure W and Measure Y, and um, both in at the county level and at the OUSD school level bond measures because we need to we need to be able to fund our communities and our state is is not covering those costs. So. Um, Prop 15, we're really, really pushing for Prop 15 to pass, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what that, what actually Prop 15 will do. So it, it closes the commercial property tax loopholes that the property is being assessed at a fair market value. So it takes property, like for example, Chevron's land in Richmond, and says this is what the current value is and then assesses them accordingly. And this assessment then continues annually to see what that property value is. When we first went back into um, trying to get schools and communities first on the ballot, you have to go through this process of like signature gathering. And before you can even get the signatures, you have to take it to the state. And the state actually does a financial assessment. And so our communities, um, who work together to write up Prop 15 all over the state. So this is like not lobbyists, these are community organizations, these are folks from that represent um, black and brown communities up and across the state um, they, that came together to write Prop 15. We thought it was gonna be about $10 million. The state came back to us and told us it's 12, I'm not 10 million, 12, 10 billion and actually it's gonna reclaim $12 billion every year um, at the value of, by, with this assessment in value. Ah, sorry. Okay, um, it also provides large tax incentives for small businesses and uh, it protects homeowners and renters um, because it doesn't actually assess that, um, assess um, home, residential homes and commercial property in terms of um, housing development. So how does it do this? It taxes the top 10% corporations. Uh, it taxes 
corporations above um, that make above $500 million a year. Uh, so that their property is then assessed at the current value. So this really targets the majority of the revenue that's coming, that $12 billion annually to the state. 92% of that is actually coming from the top 10% corporations um, in the state. And uh, Prop 15 um, exempts residential property and agricultural properties, um, and it maintains the full thir Prop 13 protections for homeowners, renters, and agriculture. Um, so what it does is that it does additional funding for school districts in California. So that 12, of that $12 billion, 40% um, of that goes directly to the school. The state can't touch it and move it into other categories. It goes directly to those spaces. And then 60% of that money actually goes to the local government. Um, so like in Alameda County, um, it's going to bring $11 billion, that, uh, $11 million that goes directly into the general fund, but then it also specifically categorizes money that will go into, um, into specific services like housing, like um, homeless services. Um, and uh, and so this is really critical because in Alameda County, this is going to bring um, about $715 million annually. And why this is critical is not only before COVID-19, but even more important with co post COVID-19 era is that we need to generate funds. We need, we're gonna have a huge shortfall. And so how are we going to be able to funnel those um, services if we don't and take care of our people um, if we don't have those funds to do so? And now Prop 15 is even more critical to that because it will generate that funds for us. So it all, at the same time, it cuts taxes for small businesses and the most folks who have been impacted by, um, by COVID-19 are actually uh, small businesses, as you know, it's not Amazon. As you all probably know, Jeff Bezos made about $50 million <laughs> uh, during the past six to eight, seven months. Um, it's hitting up small businesses. And in California, um, more than 50% of small businesses are owned by women and people of color. So this is gonna give them those, um, that tax break. So um, what does it do mainly that Prop, um, Prop 15 does? It restores balance to that property tax, right? It takes away um, that loophole that harbored and allowed corporations to benefit so deeply by, that, um, by using white fear and racism as a cover to, to benefiting and creating a property tax that benefits them. It, you know, and a lot of folks, I've been, you know, talking to folks for a really long time about Prop 15, and when I was get, grabbing signatures around it, I would get a lot of folks who would ask me, like, how do I know that the money's actually going to go where it's supposed to go? <laughs> and, um, and written into Prop 15 is that transparency and accountability. And the one assurance that I can say also is that this was written by community folks, folks up and down the state. It wasn't like corporate lobbyists. It wasn't funded by residential property owners. This was like folks um, associations. This was folks from all over the state, folks like from our organizations, folks from organizations like Community Coalition in LA, um, and you know, folks in San Diego, up and down the state who really know, who, who saw the need to really uh, think about Prop 13 from 1978 and how we might be able to make those adjustments. So, um, you know, um, Oakland Rising will be having some, uh, some, um, we'll be holding some um, volunteer days. We're having those set, and so I wish I could drop in the chat what days those will um, will will be happening. But if you follow Oakland Rising on Instagram or on Facebook. 
Um, at those sites, you'll be able to um, sign up to do some volunteering with us. We're also going to be doing in the next few weeks, as you all know, um, we've there's so much fear around um, being able to do the vote by mail. And um, so many folks in our communities don't know what to do or where to go. Uh, another big issue is that we don't have enough polling places in Alameda County. So uh, we're going to be setting up um, some um, ballot parties for people to learn about the ballot measures and then follow up with uh, ballot drop off locations so that folks can bring it and drop it in and, and you know, turn over their ballots to us and then we'll take them over to the county so that we can make sure that those pieces um, are, are shared out. So um, that's the end of my presentation. I wanted to see if there were any questions. Uh, so I see in the question it says, how about homeowners? Many of my friends who are now retired don't have the same income when they're working, wouldn't be able to pay the higher property tax. Um, I think I mentioned in the presentation that actually this will not affect proper, um, um, homeowners because it only taxes corporations. Um, it, it goes for commercial property of businesses that make over um, $250 million a year. Any other questions? Yes. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to talk about some of the opposition. Um, mm -hmm. I know there is a lot of energy on Prop 15, and I think it's absolutely amazing. Um, but I just yeah. want to outline what the opposition is saying. So as we get into the thick of the election season and folks see commercials and sponsored ads on social media and stuff, they can kind of sift through the information. Yeah, I mean, one of the big pieces is that question is about homeowners, right? Because um, so many of our folks, um, you know, immigrant communities, black and brown communities really see um, home ownership as a way to build wealth and to have um, and to some fulfillment in terms of the quote unquote American dream, right? Like people see property ownership as, as that. And no, 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 stop, stop, I'm not. Sorry, hold on. The dog got a hold of a scarf. Stop, 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 stop. Where'd the ball go? I don't know. Can I, can you grab that? It's okay. Let it go. Let it go. It's fine. It's okay. I'll just get another one. Sorry, y'all. Yeah. Our dog was tearing up, um, tearing up a oh, Luna. Luna. Okay. Hello. Can y'all hear me? Hello. Hello? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, Liz. I apologize. Sorry, my my internet went out again. So, and we had a situation with our dog um, attacking a scarf. Um, so what I was saying was that the opposition is really going after folks of color and really went hard. And so there was some confusing messages that are out there because the NAACP also uh, statewide um, is endorsed, is going no on Prop 15, so it's kind of confusing a lot of folks. But locally, um, the, uh, the local chapter is not, and we're doing a lot of work um, across, the, uh, across the state to ensure that folks understand that um, that, that is not true, that Prop, um, Prop 15 explicitly says in the ballot measure that the um, it does not go after um, commercial property. I mean, it doesn't go after residential property, that it is specific to commercial property only. The other fear is that, you know, it's sort of the snowball effect that they're always um, putting out there, right, which is a fallacy um, that 
if they come after this, they'll come after you, right? And, um, and this is not the case because we also understand that people see home ownership as a means to building wealth, a means to being able to have access um, in the community. Um, and we want to be able to move from having to um, have property tax be about um, that about uh, property tax. Um, I'm sorry, I have a little foggy brain from the smoke. Um, that uh, that fear, the fear that it would be about um, uh, about moving people away from that and about that that inherent wealth that would come with home ownership. Great. Thank you so much, Liz. This has been amazing. Um, and this is one of the requests that we had from our community to hear about Prop 15. And so I hope that um, folks are a little bit better oriented um, when they get their mail-in ballots. Um, and we'll make, for our attendees, we'll make all of our slides and information available to you all so that you all can reference this information when you do your ballot. Um, and so Yay. we'll make everything available. Yes, so we have the opportunity to, you know, read, really read through everything and not feel pressured in the polling place um, to really make some good decisions about what we want to see. Thank you. Yeah, and continue to look, continue to look out for the next coming weeks. We're going to be holding um, a ballot party yeah. so that folks will go through the entire state um, list of state measures will be coming out with a voter guide so we'll be talking through each of the state measures as well as the measures in Oakland and at the county level so that folks can um, be informed about um, about um, filling out their ballots at home so um, just know that October 5th your mail-in ballots will be sent out to you and then we'll be following up with an event um, soon after that and also followed with um, mail the ballot drop-in location. Absolutely. Thank you. And that's perfect because um, from policy to revolution we'll have some post uh, summit activations and so we will be doing some mailers to our residents and then we will also be um, sure to share out with the folks who attended um, both sessions um, and sending them opportunities that our speakers are um, hosting. And so we'd love to share out that um, ballot party information once you get it so people have that time to really go through their ballots and um, fill them out. And so yes. meet that mailing deadline. Yay. Yay. Thank you so much, Liz. Um, Thank you for having me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So we're going to press forward. Um, we're running a little early um, than usual. And so we're gonna move to our next session, um, which will be led by Elisa Victory. And so I'll give her some time to come up on screen. All right, I think um, they may be moving towards a bio break or something. And so we'll give them a moment and we will take a little break to give Elisa some time. Elisa, we can't quite hear you yet. Sorry, I'm on. I just need like two or three minutes to get some water. Of course. Okay. Take your time. I'm going to play some music for our attendees. Okay. Thanks. And um, Alisa will be going through a Know Your Rights, um, a very comprehensive Know Your Rights training for mail in voting.
And so I'll get some music going for us. Thank you, Alisa, for coming back for a second week. Um, I just can't say it enough. Your presentation last week was so comprehensive and thorough and very needed um, and helped uh, kind of lessen my anxiety about doing uh, mail-in voting. I personally go to the polls every single year, so um, have never actually uh, mailed in my vote before. So this is going to be... Uh, some information for me and I hope this kind of um, lessens folks anxiety going through this new process for some of us. So I will let you take it away. Thank you. And I'm going to share my screen again. Um, good afternoon to everybody attending, everyone listening. Thank you again to Queen Didi, to organizations, the East Bay Anti-Displacement Collective, to SF Foundation, occur and to all the other organizations that have sent preventers and are supporting this effort. I'm very happy to be here. Um, as Dee said, I'll be going over some really technical 
and really factual information about your rights in terms of voting in this election, what it looks like in terms of the mail-in process that is now being available automatically to every single California voter. Um, the slides will be made available to you all after, so don't feel like you have to take a lot of notes, but I hope you all will listen and engage and also bring your questions and also your own input. Uh, we all can learn from each other. I certainly don't know everything, and there's certainly a lot of things that are unsure about what's gonna happen in November. So I'll be clear about things that I'm not certain about. Um, and hopefully we'll have some time at the end for some questions or some discussion. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Oh, it says I'm disabled from screen sharing. If you could update my permissions. Yes, uh, Davina, could you help us uh, promote Alisa to co-host? Oh, there it goes. Thank you. Okay. Um, so you should see the intro slide or just the title of the presentation. Um, my name is Elisa Victory. Again, um, I'm the NorCal Community Programs Director with the African Black Coalition. We are a statewide collective that started out of the University of California system, is now expanded to other schools and hopefully to other states. Um, my email is also listed here and I'm happy to show this slide again at the end if you all have any direct questions. I'm also an Oakland resident and have lived in Alameda County my entire life. Um, so this presentation is going to be focused a lot on our county specifically because some of the rules and things may change based on what county you're in. So this is very focused on Alameda County. A little bit uh, again about myself, civil rights and labor attorney, also working with African Black Coalition. To see who's in the room, who's in the chat, if any of y'all are able to drop a yes or no if you've registered to vote in the past 30 days, or if you have checked on your voter registration status in the past 30 days. I know I have not, so I'm a little bit guilty. Uh, okay, I see a few people are raising their hands. Okay, we'll come back to that in a little bit. Here's just a little bit of overview on what I hope to cover in this presentation. Who can vote, how you register to vote, how you're gonna submit your ballot, key deadlines for this election. Um, we only have a few months between now and election day on November 3rd, and also some resources so that you all can follow up because again, there's some gaps or some uncertainty in the information that we have today. I do wanna start by being very honest and real and upfront that voter suppression is alive and well today. All right, we have the Voting Rights Act, but we also had part of that act gutted in 2015 before the 2016 election. There's a lot of still rampant tactics that are happening that we've already seen in the March primaries and certainly now that COVID has hit that we've seen in other states and other parts of our country where there's long lines, only two physical polling locations open in some states for their primaries. People who are been turned away from the polls and have to file last minute injunctions with the court to keep the polls open. So even though this presentation is about what your rights are, what you're supposed to do to make sure that you are eligible and registered to vote, there still may be other tactics at play and other factors that make it so that it's hard for people to actually submit their ballots or make it to the polls. Um, as just some examples of that in the March primary in our county, we had over one, around 1 1.6 million residents only around 900,000 registered to vote, but only about half of that actually turned out to vote in the March election. So even though you can be registered to vote, know what's on the ballot, know your right to vote, there's still a big gap in the number of people that register to vote versus those that actually submit their ballot. So we're hoping to close that gap by providing more education resources today. Who can vote? Uh, so you can vote if you are 18 years by November 3rd. So even if you're 17 today, but November 2nd, you turn 18, you are eligible to vote. You can register to vote in the November election. You must be a US citizen. You also must be a resident of this state. So you can be a citizen, but if you live in Washington state, 
you cannot register to vote in California, and it could lead to you being purged from voter rolls even in your own state if there is some discrepancy in voter registration. You can vote if you are incarcerated. Many people do not know this. So if you are incarcerated inside of a county jail, you are eligible to vote, you are allowed to register to vote, the jailers, the county sheriff cannot prevent you, prohibit you from registering and casting your ballot. I want to be clear that county jails are different and distinct from state or federal prison. So every county, including Alameda County, has a jail system. So if you are inside of jail, incarcerated in county jail, you are still able to register. And if you are incarcerated on election day, you are still able to vote. This includes people who are serving misdemeanors in county jails. These are people who are serving time as a condition of probation, whether misdemeanor or felony, as long as the time is served in county jail. People who are serving felony jail sentences, but again, are in county jails. And those who are being held pretrial, meaning they haven't had their trial, there is no conviction, they're simply being held and detained. Um, you're also eligible to vote and to register to vote if you're on probation, on any form of supervision, including federalized supervision. Um, and so that's very important for people to know that simply because you may have been formerly incarcerated or currently incarcerated, that does not automatically exempt you from your democratic right to vote. Formerly incarcerated people, again, are absolutely allowed mm -hmm. to vote as long as there is no active parole term. And folks who do not have a permanent address are still able and allowed to register to vote. They have the right to vote, even if they cannot list a physical permanent address. And I do have a separate slide to talk a lot more in detail about the address that you would use to register if that is your situation or you're assisting someone who's houseless. Sometimes it works better if I do the inverse for people's processes that to talk about not just who can vote, but who cannot. So people who are under age 18, meaning you will not be 18 by November 3rd, are not able to vote. You cannot cast a ballot. You cannot be registered for this November election. However, you can pre-register with the state of California so that you will already be in the voter registration system and able to get your ballot and materials as soon as you are 18 and eligible in whatever election that means for you. You can pre-register as early as age 16. So people who are still very passionate about getting involved, who want to know what it's like to go through the registration process, you're actually able to do that now so that you're already set up for success once you turn 18. Um, I do want to note that on the ballot, uh, there will be some measures statewide and in Oakland specifically that may lower the voting age to 16 or 17. That's on the ballot. So for November, the rules are still 18 by November 3rd. You cannot vote if you are in state or federal prison. You cannot vote if you're on parole for a felony conviction. So if you have completed parole and you have no more terms left, you are eligible. But if you have any active parole term left for a felony, you are not eligible to vote this November. However, on the ballot is Prop 17, which there was a presentation earlier that can be included in your materials, mm -hmm. that, that ballot measure would restore the right to vote for people in this specific category who are on parole. Um, you also cannot vote if you're found mentally incompetent by a court. Um, this would be a specific court's findings, usually based on some type of medical evidence or assessment, and mm -hmm. it would be a signed court order by a judge. So if whatever is underlying in a court case in a court case that may make a judge declare someone mentally incompetent it may also apply to their ability to vote this november so again to receive your ballot you have to be registered to vote registration can happen in three different ways it can be done online it can be done in person at county elections offices though please Note the county elections contact because I'm not clear on what their COVID restrictions may be at any time. Mm -hmm. As you all know, there's a lot happening with air quality, with fire alerts in, our, in and around our county. So in person may be the least solid option at the moment because there's going to be restrictions around that. You also have the option to register by mail. 
You can request a paper form to register that you can get from your county elections office and then you would send it back to the state elections office to process all of your information in your paper application. I'm going to go a little bit more into each of these and how they're done. So for voter, regist for voter registration, you have to provide some type of identification. The state elections office needs to know that it's really you. We're trying to avoid voter fraud. We're trying to avoid people being registered to vote in two different states or even in two different counties within our state. So identification, making sure you are you, is going to help to process your registration faster to make sure that your registration gets approved and that you'll receive your ballot for this November. I've listed out only a few of the entire list of acceptable forms of identification. So it is much broader than just your photo ID. It's much broader than a real ID. It includes your passport. It includes a California ID mm -hmm. card, a student ID, military ID, insurance plan IDs, public housing IDs, it also can include combinations of government documents like your voter guide that gets mailed to you or a utility bill, something from a government agency. To use those type of identifications, you do want them to be dated within the election period. So you want it to be within March to November 2020. You want it to have your name as you're trying to register and your address where you're trying to register listed on it. I have the link to the full list from the state of California that's in the PowerPoint that will again be circulated. So again, there's much more options of how you can establish your identity to make sure you're able to register to vote. So even if you've lost documents, if you don't have certain forms of identification that you think are standardized, there are still multiple options to make sure that people can exercise their democratic rights. If you still go through all these options and the state cannot verify your identity, your ballot will not be counted. So there's lots of options they give you, really assess which ones you have and can bring with you, even if you're going into the polls, they still need to know that you, the person in front of them, is the person who is allowed to vote. And I'll reiterate that when we talk about polling places. Voter registration. So an address is requested on your voter registration forms, whether you're doing it online, in person, or by paper. Your address for purposes of voter registration is the place that you specify, right? Someone can't tell you where you need to be registered. That's really your decision. And I know that there can be a whole myriad of, the, of different setups where people have in terms of their housing or where they're located but you can only register to vote at one address. So again, you can't register in multiple counties, in multiple cities or multiple states. You need to be registered with one address. And it should be the address where you're at the most, where you know you'll receive your voter information and your mail-in ballot. Um, you can choose if you have multiple properties that you live at. Um, for example, also if you're a student, you may live somewhere when school is in session and live somewhere else, maybe a whole different state when school is not in session. You have the option to decide which address you want to use to register. But just know that that's where you're gonna be getting your mailing materials. And if you want a physical polling place, it's gonna be connected to what's closest to the address you registered with. So if you're not gonna be at school, you may not wanna register with your school address for the November election. Courts have ruled that persons without homes, homeless persons, are able to register to vote at the site that they're found at the most, the place where they spend their most time. For some people, it may be a church or a mission or some other type of resource center where they're able and authorized to use that address to register. If not, if it is someone in a curbside community, in a tent city, we have many of them in our county, certainly in Oakland, you're still eligible and able to register to vote. You should describe the place that you are located at most with as much detail and specificity as you can so that the elections office can identify you as someone who can vote in this county, right? Because again, your election materials and who's on your ballot changes by city and county. So you want to at least establish, you know, I'm always at this park 
in this specific city. This park is clearly located in this county, so I can vote in this county. So again, any markers, landmarks, parks, streets, and intersections can be used to help identify for the elections office where you are located within our state so that they can help register you to be allowed to vote in your neighborhood where you spend the most time. Um, a short visual just about some of the upcoming deadlines and they are fast approaching. We're only a few weeks away from the mail-in ballots being sent out by the state elections office. Every single person in California who is registered to vote by October 5th will be receiving mail-in ballots. You don't have to request it when you register. You can still list your preference as in-person polling, as I usually do, and you will still, or you're still supposed to be getting a mail-in ballot so that you have the option. This was done by executive order from our governor in response to the COVID pandemic so that people have the option to stay at home, to not have to go to a physical polling place, to not have to interact with anyone, even poll workers, to be able to fill it out in your home, seal it in an envelope and drop it off. And we'll talk about returning your ballot in a minute. October 19th, which is 15 days before the election, is your deadline to register online or by mail. You should still receive your mail-in ballots even if you are registering at these dates, um, we'll talk a little bit about the Postal Service and what their timelines have been looking like. Um, again, you still will receive a mail-in ballot, even if you register by the online registration deadline, which is the 19th. The deadline to register at your county elections office, and again, this is the in-person option that may have changed a bit due to COVID restrictions. The deadline is seven days before the election, which is October 27th. That's the deadline to register at the county elections office um, to basically be pre-registered to get your voter info guide and materials. November 3rd is the final last day you could register to vote and it's also election day. So yes, even on the day of the election, you can walk in person with your identification or with proof that you've already been registered. You can register on site at your county election office with all your appropriate documentation, or you can walk in in person at a polling site. Again, going back to the identification pieces, you don't wanna to have to keep going back and forth to a polling site or risk getting turned away. So it is always, always best and advisable to pre-register before October check your registration before October, even if you believe you've been registered to vote for years. Um, California this year has purged over 5 million voters from its rolls. So you do not know that your voter status could have possibly changed or been eliminated um, in that process. So even if you've been registered to vote, you wanna check your status. Um, and that's actually my next slide is just a reminder to check your registration status even if you've been registered at the same address for 50 years, you always get a mail-in ballot, still check given all of the things that are happening with registration and elections changing because of COVID, but also California has purged people from its rolls. And so to make sure you didn't get caught up or erroneously purged in that process, make sure you check your voter registration status, even if you believe it's already done. So how to submit your ballot. There's a few options. Once you've already opened your ballot, completed and voted for all the offices you want to vote for, you would seal it and sign it. And then there's a few options of how to return it so that your ballot's actually counted um, in time for it to make a difference in the election result. The first option you have is mail. You're gonna get your ballots in the mail. You can return them by mail. Um, so you can drop them in any postal service box. You can walk into any uh, post office and drop it at the counter. There is no postage required. If you mail in your ballot that's already completed, all of them come with a prepaid, postage paid envelope. You do not have to pay anything to return your completed ballot. You just have to make sure you do it on time. They have to be postmarked by election day, which is November 3rd, by 8 p.m. And they need to be received to the elections office 
the state capitol by November 20th, which is 17 days after. I do want to caution that we've all heard and seen that the federal government had several post office boxes, blue drop bins, removed from downtown Oakland. Several of them, my understanding, was nearby courthouses and other areas that are central to the downtown area. I've since heard that they've been replaced. There's nothing to necessarily stop the federal government from doing that again or from delaying the Postal Service, which we we're also hearing about the delay times, there has been layoffs, and that even the Postal Service's guaranteed packages have not been getting there on time right now within their guaranteed time. So this is a concern for the election. Again, best practice would be to complete your ballot by mail early and submit it by mail early. Another best practice is to maybe go some of the other options that do not rely on the Postal Service. One of them is the county drop box locations. So the County of Alameda offers its own drop boxes where you can submit completed ballots that will be safe and secure inside their drop boxes, then the county becomes responsible for submitting all of those back to the state elections office for processing. This option again requires no cost, no money. It needs to be received still by November 3rd, 8 p.m. All of the deadlines are still on election day to return a completed ballot, but drop boxes are additional option that does not rely on the Postal Service, but will send it directly to your county elections office, who can then transfer them directly to the state elections office. Here's a image on the left side of your screen is one of the county drop boxes. Um, right now they're around county courthouses and other county properties. On the right side is a screen grab from the county's elections website where it has a physical map that you can search, you can zoom in or out to see where all of the current drop box locations are, which are the blue markers. The orange ones, however, are pending Dropbox locations. I'm not entirely clear on what pending means. I'm not sure if that means pending approval or a pending actual placement on those locations. I'm hoping they'll all turn to blue as approved locations because the more opportunities you have, the easier it will be for people to vote. So this, uh, this link goes to the county drop box locations and again the blue are the existing drop boxes that already are placed around the county that you have the option to return your ballot the orange are ones that we hope will be added and this again can be updated with even more locations as we get closer to the november election so this is one area where it's still not clear what the total number and all the locations are going to be for the drop box locations but it should be more than we have currently. I also want to note that you have a tab on the county website that talks about voting early. They are going to have physical drop off locations where you can walk inside and drop off your ballot. And they're located in different areas based on the cities within the county. So again, it's kind of specific to where you reside within Alameda County. But that is another option for you to return a completed ballot is to walk into a county vote early site to give them your completed ballot and it's essentially a little more personalized than you dropping it into the county drop box you also have the option of not even leaving your house to return the ballot but having someone else do it for you and this again is returning it either to voting to early vote locations by the county or to polling places on election day. However, you have to take an extra step when it's completing your ballot to be able to have someone else drop it off for you. To authorize another person to submit your ballot on the envelope itself, you usually have to sign and date it with your own signature to verify you as the voter have completed this ballot. And as you see in the image here, which is, um, from our county's sample site in 2018, it has an authorization and declaration on the back where it allows you to list the name of another person that you're going to drop it off, that's going to drop off your ballot and sign saying that you authorize them to do that. 
your ballot still needs to be sealed and signed by you. You need to fill out the additional portion that authorized another person to drop it off for you. The only prohibition is that the person dropping off cannot receive money per ballot that they collect. Um, we want to make sure that our, there's no money tied to people voting because voting is free. It should be free to register. It's free to return your ballot. So there shouldn't be anyone charging you to do this service. And I know there are some organizations that may be coordinating how to do drop off ballots for people who really are not able to during COVID or for other reasons. So that is one option you have. The authorization will be on the back of your envelope that you need to return your completed ballot in. Submitting your ballot, another free option is going to the polling location. Again, you can have someone else do this, but you can also do this yourself. If you did not receive a mail-in ballot, you absolutely need to go to your local polling place and ask for a ballot on the spot so you can still cast your vote on election day. Your polling locations are listed on your voter guides. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what's in your voter guide. Um, polling locations are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. on election day, which is November 3rd. To be able to access a polling location and make sure you can get inside to vote, you have to be standing in line by 8 p.m. So even if you're not in the door yet, that's fine. The law says you must be in the line to vote by 8 p.m. And the poll workers have to keep the location open until everyone who made the cutoff is able to get inside and vote. Finding your polling location. Um, so there's definitely online tools. Um, you can go to our county registrar of voters. Again, the links will be reiterated at the end of the presentation. You can look up your voter, your voter profile, which kind of tells you your whole history of voting what party you're registered with, your address, what your preference is, and will also tell you your polling location. You can also download a polling list that tells you throughout the entire county where all the polling locations are based on precincts. You can also, the easiest way is to look at the voter guide. The voter guide is going to be mailed to you. I have not received mine for November, but I do have mine from March. So it says Alameda County Voter Information Guide on the front of it. And on the back, it tells you where your polling location is. Um, so that's one of the easiest ways is to look at the materials that will be sent directly to your address where you're registered to vote. And it will have your polling place on the front or the back of the guide. And I'm gonna talk again more about what's in your guide and how it can be helpful to you. But voting at the polls. Again, you have to be in line by 8 p.m. if you're gonna vote. And this is whether you're going to submit your mail-in ballot that's already completed. You shouldn't have to wait in line. You should be able to drop that at the polling location. But if you're going to vote at the polls, meaning you didn't want to complete your mail-in ballot or you didn't receive a mail-in ballot or you didn't register in time to get a mail-in ballot or you're registering on November 3rd on election day, you have to be in line by 8 p.m. A lot of people are concerned that with expected long waits, long lines, if they have a job, if they have other obligations, how are you able to vote? For your employer, you have the right to take up to two hours off of your job if your work schedule conflicts with the voting hours, which is again, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. So if you have a work shift that does not permit you to vote from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. on November 3rd, your boss, your employer has to give you at least two hours off to go and vote. And that time will, cannot result in you losing pay. So you still need to be paid for your same hours if you have to take that time off to vote. It cannot go against your wages for that day. If you need to exercise this option, though, your employer is not a mind reader. They can't make sure that they can give you the time they need if you don't tell them. So you need to provide notice to your employer. Notice is always best in writing. So write it in an email, write it in a text even, write it on a piece of paper and sign and date it. 
something that says, this is the date, I'm letting you know at least two business days before the election that I'm going to need time off to be able to cast my vote because my schedule conflicts. The employer also has an obligation under California law to post a notice in the workplace saying that all of its workers have a right to this, that you have a right to notify them, you have a right to the time off and without losing pay. And employers are supposed to do that within 10 business days before the election. Again, just because something is the law doesn't mean that everybody follows it, but at least you all know what your rights are and how to find them. And the elections code is listed here in the PowerPoint. Again, this is state law. It cannot be changed by your employment agreements or anything else that an employer may try to tell you if you need to take time off to vote. What to bring to the polls? Again, if you're planning to wait in line, if you want to cast your ballot at the polling place and not use your mail-in ballot, you need to make sure you have identification, even if you're already registered to vote. I've certainly shown up where there's been typos, where my address has been different, where they don't have me listed at all. So still bring your identification. If you have anything that verified your voter registration status, bring that as well. If you are voting for the very first time, you absolutely need to bring identification with you. Glasses, right? Other accommodations, things that will help you see, help you write um, to make sure you can complete your ballot by hand, right? There's not gonna be, you can't set up your own computer in the polling location. Um, it's kind of frowned upon to be on your phone the whole time because other people are trying to concentrate and focus on their ballot. So it's best to bring whatever materials you may need to get through your ballot and to, and to get your vote done. Um, the county election voter guide, which I've shown you a little bit of, is really helpful because it's going to list out what races are in your ballot. And there are lots. I'm gonna have a slide that kind of lists all the different offices and ballots that could be on your ballot. It may change based on city, even within the county that you live in. But your voter guide, one, it's gonna tell you where your polling place is. If you open it, the very first page helps give you some guidance on how to fill in a ballot, right? Complete circles, you know, kind of like you're taking a test in school, make sure you don't draw outside the lines. It also tells you about some of the early voting locations. But they have sample ballots. They let you know who is on the ballot, what races they are. And if you look at the very top, it tells you the name of the office. Mm -hmm. It's also going to tell you how many you mm -hmm. can vote for. The one I'm showing you right now is for a county central committee. Mm -hmm. It says you can vote for no more than 11. So some people may think, I just have to choose mm -hmm. one person out of this entire list. But the very top mm -hmm. of each sample tells you how many votes you're going to have on each area. So the county ballot guides are sent to you before the election. Again, depends on if you've registered in advance. They can't send you materials in advance if you haven't registered and you're going to register on the election day. So it's better to pre-register ahead of November, ahead of October really, so that you can get your voter info guide, have time to look through it, to again, prepare yourself to know what's on your ballot, who's on your ballot, and where you'd like to vote. Um, if you have 11 options, it may take you a long time to go through them all and to narrow down your top 11 at the polling place. So the voter guide is really a resource for you to have time to really go through and understand what you're voting on and what the consequences of that vote's gonna be. Poll workers cannot help you. They can't tell you how to vote. They can't give you advice about the ballot. They can't explain to you, you know, yes means this, no means this. The ballot's going to explain that and it's about you taking the time to read through it and understand it. The poll workers are there to help make sure that your ballots are getting to you and that they're going to get submitted, that they get processed correctly to the elections office, that people that are at that polling location are eligible and registered to vote in that location. They cannot, again, tell you how to vote or really talk to you about specifics of what's on your ballot and what you should think about it. 
So, you know, don't think about voting as just on the spot on November 3rd, but you have up in, from now up until November 3rd to really prepare yourself to vote and what that's going to mean. A few more tips throughout the polls, get in line early. Um, you don't want to have to be that person who's fighting with poll workers and begging with them or hoping that an injunction makes the poll stay open longer. You don't want to risk not being able to cast your ballot because there are so many things that are going to be on the line this election. Um, so many things can shift based on the outcomes. So you don't want to lose your opportunity to influence what's going to happen with the future of your city, your county, or your country. Again, polling locations open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. on November 3rd. Even if you do think there may be a wait, or even if you don't, I would say still be prepared with things like water, with snacks. We've seen it can go from being really hot one day to being ash falling from the sky. Again, whatever the weather conditions are, you may not be able to wait inside. Um, given COVID restrictions already limit the number of people and how close you can be together. So really think about what materials you're going to need to be comfortable to wait in line if there is a line. Best practice is to get to the polls as early as possible so that you have enough time to wait and be able to cast your ballot and hopefully you can get there and beat the line before it forms. Um, review your county elections information again to be familiar with what's on the ballot. What are you being asked to vote for? What are your options? How many, can, how many votes do you have for each seat or each ballot measure? Complete only the ballot that's given to you by the poll workers, right? Whatever you might bring or even if you have your mail-in ballot, that needs to be completed and sealed. If you're going to the polls, the poll workers will give you a ballot to go and take at the polls. You need to use only the pens provided to you by the poll workers. Um, your voter guide tells you you can only use blue or black ink, right? So no trying to be cute with glitter, with green or highlighter. Uh, you cannot mark up your book with anything besides the legally allowed utensils, which is blue and black ink, and those are to be provided at each poll site. Do not harass poll workers. I cannot stress this enough. Most of these folks are you know, seasonally employed just for the elections to make sure that we have enough staff at the locations, to make sure we can open enough polling places around our communities. It is even harder to find enough people when we're in a health pandemic, right? People have, are risking a lot to be out here serving the public to make sure we can all cast our votes and participate in democracy. Do not harass the poll workers. Right? If you're in a long line, you may be frustrated, you may be hot, you may not want to wear your mask, but they are not in control of the rules. The rules are set by the county and by state elections. They, again, can't help you explain what your ballot is and how to fill it out and who you should vote for. You have those resources available to you through trainings like this, through your voter guide, and certainly through the county election site until November 3rd. So do not harass your poll workers be patient with them and respect that they are there trying to do a job as well. You also are prohibited from wearing or displaying anything that advocates for specific candidates or measures. Not a lot of people know this, maybe candidates do, but even if you are a candidate and you want to remind people to vote for you right before they walk into their polling place, that's a great tactic, but you have to be at least 100 feet away from the polling place. By state law, you are not allowed within that distance um, to be influencing how people are voting at that moment. So again, don't try to break the rules. Don't have poll workers have to come outside to remind you or tell you. You also can be turned away from voting. So if you walk in with a huge shirt for the president you want to vote for, still you may be turned away from voting, or you may be asked to put a jacket on or cover it up. So be very mindful of what the law already is and that poll workers may have to enforce these. Hopefully they'll be enforced equally. People are still people, but you will be more empowered if you still know what the your technical rights are before you go to the polling place. Uh, so this slide is about what is on your ballot. 
I'm not going to talk about any specific candidates or race, but wanted to let you all know what are some of the likely possibilities that are going to be on this November ballot. We're absolutely going to have a presidential election um, to decide a new commander in chief on this ballot. Federal office elections, depending on what area you live in, again, your address you use to register is very important because it will change the offices you can vote for on your ballot. So if there's a federal election such as Congress that represents your district, that's going to be on your ballot. Statewide ballot measures, again, we heard about Prop 15 in California and several others. Those will be on everyone's ballot. State office elections. These are officials, people who are running for office. Again, depending on your district, it can be a state senator or assembly person um, who will be on the ballot. County ballot measures. Um, certainly anything for Alameda County is going to be on your ballot if you're registered in Alameda County. County office elections. We have a judicial officer that will be on everyone's ballot there's also a board of county supervisors, I believe two, that will be on this ballot, maybe one, I'm not sure. Um, but it depends if you live in that supervisor's district within the county. There's also city ballot measures. I'm gonna again plug the city of Oakland's Oakland Youth Vote, um, which would give the right of 16 and 17 year olds in our city the ability to vote for school board elections. Um, so that is a measure that I personally support and hope you all will look into if you're registered in Oakland. City office elections, those include city council, city attorney. Um, there's also school board, which can be by city, but some school districts expand beyond a uh, city. That's why I have them as a separate bullet point. So there are school board elections in Oakland happening, um, but there are certain other districts that may not be city but school districts themselves that are electing officers. There are BART director positions that will be on the ballot depending on which BART district you live in. There also may be special district races like water board, for example, which are all elected, right? So it's important when they say, make sure you vote all the way down the ballot, meaning presidents at the very top and there may be so much media and attention to certain races and certain positions that that's what you think you're voting for and the only thing you can vote for. I'm just here to remind you that your voter guide is going to include all of the down ballot measures and candidates that will be on your ballot for November. It's important to still do your research and to look into who your options are for those down ballot races because they affect things like your city budget like your school district and your children, or like our transportation with BART. So they still are very important positions, important measures that will impact your lives and the people and your neighbors around you. If you haven't heard from these candidates who represent you, that might be a bad sign, but many of them do have websites. I know there's been several more online forums and opportunities to hear about what's gonna be on the ballot in November. But still important takeaway is to do your research. Know that your voting time isn't just at the polls on November 3rd. It is now until then, understanding what you have the power to vote on and using that power well. Tracking your ballot. So we talked about different ways you can register. We talked about mail-in ballots. We talked about how to return your ballots whether you've done mail-in and about going to the polls on election day. Once you've submitted your ballot, you're able to track it um, to again, make sure that your ballot is actually gonna be counted and that it will, it's going to you'll be a part of the um, results on whatever ballot measure or whatever office that you voted for. So mail-in, you can track online at wheresmyballot.sos.ca.gov. Again, this is part of the Secretary of State's website where all of these links are housed. Um, you can sign up when you submit your mail-in ballots and you can get automatic email, text, or a voice call about every step and status about your ballot. If you're submitting your ballot at the poll, you will receive a receipt stub at the end that's kind of ripped off the bottom and it has a tracking number. 
and it'll give you the website where you can go to enter that tracking number and it'll track where your ballot actually gets to and confirm once it has been received by the state elections office. All ballots have to be tallied and counted for the election unless they were dropped by someone and you did not sign that authorization saying I give permission to my friend, to my cousin, to my partner to drop this ballot for me. It has to have the additional authorization to do that. Another reason is you were not registered to vote at all. I'm not sure how you got a ballot, but if you were never registered and the state can't find any registration for you, they're not going to count your ballot. And the last is again, if it was not received by November 20th. So if you somehow dropped the ball and forgot the deadline, if you didn't mail in your completed ballot until November 10th or November 15th, you've missed the deadline and they cannot legally count your ballot and consider it as part of the November result. So it is so important to pay attention to the deadlines. And if you're doing mail, knowing that mail has been a bit unsure about their guarantees even, um, that they've been failing to meet. So if you're going to submit your completed ballot by mail, do it as early as possible, as early as possible so that you do not risk the state elections office not receiving it by November 20th. Um, I think I skipped, sorry, I will skip. This is my second to last slide. I once again highlight poll workers. Um, our county is currently hiring for poll workers. Um, I have the application link that's listed there. You can also go to acvote.org to find out more information and the full online application. To be eligible, you need to be a registered voter within this county or the state, or a legal permanent resident or green card holder, or a high school student who is an election worker, or a county employee, or a California state employee. So there's much broader eligibility to help work at the polls. Again, poll workers are really needed in this election in particular because many people's health circumstances, personal circumstances do not allow them to be able to do this role right now with the health pandemic going on. So if you know people who may be younger, who may be in better health um, and who have the time certainly to encourage them to apply and apply now, the more poll workers we have, the more locations we'll be able to have open and to staff. And again, the more polling locations we have, the easier it will be for people to cast their ballot, to drop their ballots off, to register if they didn't get um, their registration done earlier or if there was some issue. So there has to always be this fallback option on election day. We don't wanna end up like other states that only had like less than 10 for the entire state. So the more poll workers we have, the more polling places we're able to open and keep staff. And um, I just reiterated the languages that the county is hoping to also be able um, to hire for poll workers. There's people who speak Burmese, Chinese, Hindi, Khmer, Korean, Laotian, Mian, Mongolian, Punjabi, Spanish, Tagalog, Telugu, excuse me if I'm pronouncing any of the languages incorrect, and Vietnamese. So if you know people who again have those uh, language abilities who are fluent to be able to assist people at the polls and who have the time and capacity before and leading up to November 3rd, please encourage them to apply. Um, here's a few resources. Again, the main ones are our county registrar of voters, right? They control everything in terms of your voter registration status, getting your voter guides, helping you to register and letting you know about polling locations, drop boxes, and other resources or questions. Um, they're located in downtown Oakland. They also have a lot of information on their website, including your voter profile that you can log into and check out. They also have phone numbers. Um, the Secretary of State um, controls all of our state elections. They have a toll-free hotline where you can call and also you can visit their website with lots of information, downloadable, frequently asked questions, um, they also have a lot of resources in various languages. Their website is sos.ca.gov elections. My organization, the African Black Coalition, 
um, putting out a 2020 voter guide. I believe it will be sent with the materials, but you can also follow us at A Black Coalition um, for more information and for some of our other content on the election. Um, also plug ACLU of Northern California, aclunc.org slash vote. Has several just information, know your rights sheets, uh, especially ones about those who are currently incarcerated, formerly incarcerated, and organizations that are working with these populations. I'm going to conclude now, but definitely want to know what questions people have, what comments people have. I'm also going to drop in the chat um, the link if you are interested in volunteering with Oakland Rising, who presented on Prop 15 that they will be helping organize people to volunteer for that state prop to get out the vote and also make sure people are educated on what that can do for our state and county. So I'll drop the link, please share it or please sign up yourselves if you're interested in volunteering at all for that proposition. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Alisa. Um, we're gonna open up for any questions folks have, questions, comments, concerns. Um, I always like to remind folks that um, if you're doing your mail-in ballot, that information will be available in your preferred language. And so you can request your voter guide to come in your preferred language. Um, as we've heard today, there are some opportunities to go to a ballot party where everyone can fill in their ballots and get a little voter education before um, they submit their votes. And also just another reminder to do this when you get your ballot. Don't wait until the last minute. Um, our mail system and our mail, our post system right now has just been a little delayed. And so we wanna ensure that all of the ballots get counted. And so I'll give folks a few moments to put their questions, comments, concerns in our Q&A. Okie dokie. So thank you so much, Elisa, for taking the time with us for our second go around. Um, every time you do this, I remember something else <laughs> that I need to think about for filling out my mail-in ballot. And so this has been just very helpful. I'm going to pull your presentation the minute I get my ballot so I can <laughs> go through everything and make sure that I'm doing things correctly. I am always guilty of using the wrong pen. I love a colored pen. Um, so thank you for giving us the complete rundown on everything we should know. Um, I'm going to move us forward to our next session. Um, and so I'm going to invite Brother Yoel to come forward and get us ready. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. And so I'm going to stop my screen share, brother, so you can do yours. All right. Let me All right. See. Okay. Let me see if I can share this. And I was told last time that my thing was not in present mode. So let me um, do that. Let me just do this right here. All right. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yoel Haile. I am here today to um, talk with you all about Proposition 20 um, and um, why we should oppose and vote no on uh, ballot measure Proposition 20, um, otherwise known as the prison spending scam ballot measure to maintain mass incarceration and white supremacy. Um, so I'll go through these slides and then um, we'll have some time, hopefully at the end for um, question and answer. So just from the actual ballot summary, what is Proposition 20, what does it do? Um, and then we'll go into why it's bad. Um, so Proposition 20 uh, and its formal name is the Criminal Sentencing, Parole and DNA Collection Initiative. Um, it does four things. 
One, the first thing it does is it limits access to parole programs established for uh, people convicted of nonviolent um, felonies who have completed the full term of their primary offense or the, the main offense that they're convicted of and are serving time in by eliminating their eligibility for parole um, so that it, it would eliminate a category of people who've been convicted of certain crimes from being eligible for parole, which they currently are under Proposition 57. The second thing it does is it changes the standards and requirements that govern the parole decision process. So there's a parole board in California that's appointed by the governor. It has certain rules and um, you know regulations of how they govern the parole process, you know, which needs a whole host of reforms, but that's a separate conversation. Uh, you know, but what Proposition 20 does is it adds uh, you know, more requirements and standards for how they govern the parole process. Um, the third thing it does is it changes the law such that such that things that are currently charged uh, by law as misdemeanors would become felonies, right? Um, and what that means is that if you steal something worth $100 or worth like, you know, $150, right? Like, you know, wet wipes, food, things like that. Um, if the dollar amount is above $250, um, you would be charged with a felony right now if you steal anything like petty theft up to the value of which is $950, um, you know, the offense is a misdemeanor and it's, it's dealt as a misdemeanor. Uh, but what Proposition 20 does is it lowers that to $250 and it makes anything above $250 um, as a felony charge, which carries a whole host of uh, consequences by way of eligibility for housing, employment, uh, financial aid, you know, all of that stuff. And then the fourth thing that it does is it requires people convicted of specific misdemeanors to submit collection of DNA samples to a state database, which is an incredible invasion of uh, privacy and complete overreach of government power. So what is the fiscal impact of Proposition 20 as it stands? So based on the analysis of the legislative um, you know, analy uh, analysis office, LAO, I think that's what it stands for. Uh, based on their analysis, um, they estimate that the increased state and local corrections cost, money that's spent for prisons and jails, will be likely in the tens of millions of dollars every year. Um, and that, that cost will primarily be around county jail population, which they, they assume will increase because of you know, because this law would criminalize a whole host of things as felonies and also the level of community supervision or probation and parole. Um, the second piece is that uh, there's an increase in local court related costs that could be several million dollars annually. And then the third estimate is that um, there will be an increased local and state law enforcement cost uh, of more than a few million dollars annually related to the collecting and processing of the DNA samples. So all in all, we're looking at you know tens of millions of dollars, uh, probably hundreds of millions of dollars of new expenditure to the state um, in order to actually implement Proposition 20. So what is the context in which Proposition 20 has come in, into place, right? And the context is really, uh, let me see if I can get rid of this. Um, and so the context is really, uh, you know, that of mass incarceration and white supremacy. You know, as most people know, uh, this country in the 1970s, you see on the graph on the left, um, had about 300,000, 350,000 people incarcerated in the entire country. Uh, because of, you know, Richard Nixon's war on drugs, Ronald Reagan's, you know, tough on crime era, Bill Clinton's more tough on crime era and the mass incarceration bill, um, you now have an incarceration in this rate in this country that went from around 350,000 in the 70s to 2.2 million people in cages in the present day. Um, and, Cal and you know, this is the national trend and you can see the California trend on the right side. This is the incarceration rate from the late 70s. You see it going up, uh, you know, all the way the prison population, uh, the prison incarceration rate 
uh, you know, go up and then kind of stay up. And it's been slowly reducing since 2011 uh, to the present day. So what, what happened in 2011 um, that has slowly been reducing the prison and jail population? Um, by the way, the second piece of, you know, the context here is, you know, white supremacy and the racial disparity that, you know, we know exist in this country. So if you look at the, the graph on the right, in California, you see that black people are 6% of the population, but we make up about 27% of the incar you know, people incarcerated in jails and prisons. Uh, Latinos make up about 38% of the state, but 41% of the prison population. By contrast, white people make up about 40% of the state, but 26% of the you know, jail and prison population. Another way of looking at this is per 100,000 people uh, in, for every racial group, right? White people have about 453 people incarcerated. Latinos have about 757. Black people have 3,036. Black people are incarcerated for every 100,000 of us. And American Indian and Alaska Natives have about 996. So what, what is clear here in terms of the way prisons and jails and in the entire uh, criminal legal system in this country operates is that, you know, it's really by design set up to cage um, and control black people and other people of color. Um, so in 2011, you know, going back to the paragraph we were talking about, California was dealing with a horrible and unconstitutional prison overcrowding, you know, the prisons. Um, and because of that, you know, the prisons got sued. And ultimately, the Supreme Court ruled that, you know, this kind of overcrowding where you had, you know, three people per bed, uh, you know, 160 something thousand people incarcerated in California, in prisons that were only designed to hold 80,000 people. So they were at 200% capacity. Um, and the Supreme Court ruled that this was cruel and unusual, and it led to horrible uh, lack of services and health care um, and all kinds of uh, resources that people needed. Um, and the budget implication of all of this was that in 2009, California taxpayers spent about 11% of the state budget or about $8, $8 billion to house about 160 people, as, as I mentioned, in 33 state prisons designed to hold only 80,000 people. Obviously, the situation was so horrific that the Supreme Court ruled um, the overcrowding violated the U.S. Constitution, and it ordered uh, Governor Brown at that time to reduce its state prison uh, population by 33,000 uh, people within two years. Um, right now, you know, fast forward 10 years, you know, the state spends about 7% of its budget to house about 105 uh, people in prisons. Um, you know, because of COVID-19, Governor Newsom ordered about 8,000 people to be released from, um, from prisons. <coughs> excuse, <laughs> excuse me. Um, uh, obviously, you know, while it, eight, uh, the release of 8,000 people is good, it is absolutely not sufficient. And the governor, you know, has absolutely failed um, in this instance in that the public health officials have repeatedly said that a 50% reduction is what is necessary in state prisons in order to try to uh, prevent and contain a COVID-19 outbreak. And obviously that didn't happen. And because of that, we are seeing an outbreak in Folsom State Prison and San Quentin State Prison, uh, Chino and, and all the other state prisons uh, where an outbreak of COVID-19 has spread widely throughout the prisons and many people have died. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, because the Supreme Court ordered um, you know, the governor to reduce prison population, the following things happened, right? So um, AB 109, that was the first law that Governor Brown and um, all the advocates put in place in order to reduce the number of people in state prisons. And what AB 109 did is it shifted the imprisonment of people who were convicted of non-serious, non-violent and non-sexual offenses uh, as defined in the statute and the penal code uh, for those folks to be um, incarcerated in the local jails instead of in state prisons. Um, this happened in 2011. In 2014, Proposition 47 came to the voters 
um, it got approved by the voters by about 60%. And what it did is it changed several, you know, petty, you know, uh, petty crimes and property crimes and drug crimes uh, from being charged as felonies to and downgraded them to being charged as, as misdemeanors. And then the third reform that came to place was Proposition 57 uh, in 2016, and it increased the parole chances for people convicted of nonviolent crimes, as, as defined in the state law, um, and gave them more opportunities to earn sentence reduction credits for good behavior, for participating in educational programs and rehabilitative programs, and it gave people hope and it gave them ways to be able to uh, participate in healthy rehabilitative and educational programs and give them the ability to reduce their sentences and to go up before the parole board uh, sooner than they would otherwise do. it. Um, so in terms of public support for these reforms, um, you know, when Proposition 47 passed in 2014, it passed by about 60%, 59.6% percent of Californians voted. Uh, only two out of the 58 district attorneys in California supported this. Um, in 2016, Proposition 57 passed by about 64.5 percent. Only one DA in the entire state of California supported Proposition 57. And one of the reasons why we're showing this is that district attorneys as kind of the top cops or the you know high law enforcement officials who are elected um, are actually going against the will of the voters, the will of the people who voted for them in the county, uh, when the public at large and in, the, in their counties and, and the state um, at large is supporting uh, criminal justice reform that would reduce incarceration, that would reduce the criminalization of poverty, mental health issues, substance use disorder issues, and all of that. So what was the fiscal impact of Proposition 47? So. Proposition 47, for, since the first year it got, you know, put in place, it has saved the state, you know, uh, nearly $40 million, you know, in 2015-16, and, and uh, cost savings to the state has been steadily increasing over the last few years, that this year it's actually estimated uh, that it will save the state $122 million. Um, and where does this money go, right? And this money goes, uh, in, in the breakdown that you see on the right side. So 65% of the 122 million that was saved will go into mental health services, substance abuse services, and diversion programs. About 10% of it goes to trauma recovery programs. And then about 25% of it goes to K through 12 school programs for at-risk students. These are the kind of investments that prevent crime from even happening in the first place. Um, and counties have uh, some discretion in, in allocating these Proposition 47 dollars. And in Alameda County, one of the first counties to do this, 50% of the savings from Proposition 47 actually goes to CBOs, to community-based organizations doing the work of you know, saving our youth, working with our youth, and serving our, our young people, uh, and you know, serving victims, serving uh, the community as a whole with all the different material needs uh, that exist. Um, and these are the ways that the dollars from Proposition 47 have been spent. What's the fiscal impact of Proposition 57? So Proposition 57 is expected to reduce the population by more than 2,600 people in 2017 and 18, uh, with a net cost of nearly 40 million. And long-term, um, Proposition 57 is estimated to put the population at, you know, to reduce the population by you know, 11,500 people for an annual savings of more than $180 million per year. So, you know, and what Proposition 20 does is it, it eliminates sections of Proposition 47, Proposition 57, and AB 109 uh, for an additional cost expenditure to the state and for more people to be incarcerated. It's really a way of going backwards uh, to the mass incarceration era um, or to the harsher version of the mass incarceration era because we're still in it. Um, and, you know, criminalize more people, criminalize, um, criminalize more people, criminalize poor people and incarcerate people for a longer and longer period of time. Um, so Proposition 20, who's behind it? And 
if you go on their website, you will see that the police and the prison guards and the district attorneys, that's who's behind Proposition 20. Uh, they it literally says support the police. Yes, on Prop 20. Um, and it says California politicians have taken away the tools for police to hold criminals accountable and enforce law and order. It's time to restore that power. Very Trumpian, um, you know, law and order as, as, you know, as the code word they've always used since the 70s with Nixon um, to lock up, you know, black and brown people. Um, and it says that politicians are the ones who take who took away these tools when it's the public really through Proposition 47 and 57 and the overwhelming support those you know ballot measures received that the public really said this the way the system is working is actually not working it needs to change um and they've tried to change you know to take away these uh, to chip away at proposition 47 and 57 through the legislature they failed miserably multiple times so now they're you know they're trying to put it on the ballot they tried to put it on the ballot in 2018 they didn't have enough signatures, so they pushed it to 2020, and they're putting it on the ballot now. And that's who who is behind Proposition 20: it's the police, the prison guards, it's the DAs, and these are all people whose jobs depend on locking people up. Um, so, in summary, uh, you know, the coalition that is opposing Proposition 20 are you know, the chief probation officers, the partnership to end domestic violence, uh, the California Democratic Party, the National Center for Victims of Crime, uh, you know, Governor Jerry Brown, Crime Survivors for Safety and Justice, SCIU, Teachers Association, at the ACLU of California. So there's a broad community organizations um, that support, you know, uh, Proposition 47 and 57 want to keep progressing and that are opposing Proposition 20. And in short, what it does is it wastes taxpayers' money. Uh, it is very extreme, completely out of line with other states and um, or, or even the direction California is going. It rolls back the progress we've achieved so far. Um, and it's opposed by virtually everybody except, you know, uh, the law enforcement um, people. So, you know, I say all of that to say, um, you know, Please tell, you know, vote no on 20, on Proposition 20. Tell all your friends um, and all your family to vote no on Proposition 20. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Yoel. Um, I just had, you know, a few questions um, and just kind of, I wanted to better understand um, what this looks like and kind of the power that our DAs and prosecutors wield in Alameda County? Yeah, so I think, <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken, um, the Alameda, you know, the voters in Alameda County have actually voted at a much higher rate um, to pass Proposition 47 and 57. I think it's probably in the 70%. Um, and I believe the DA stayed out of both of them. Um, and, you know, she did not support either one. You know, we do have a meeting with her next Tuesday where these questions will be brought up. Um, you know, but the, you know, one of the things that's striking really is that, um, you know, what Proposition 20 is doing is it gives power back to the prosecutors to charge somebody, you know, who stole something worth $200, right? Could literally be a bike or groceries um, and charge that person as a felon, with a felony. Um, and really ruin their lives. And in, I mean, we're talking about Alameda County. So there's like, you know, there's four white men and one Asian woman who control all the felony offers in the, you know, in the entire county in Alameda. They're both horrible. I mean, they're all horrible. Uh, and, um, and you know, when, when they're charging somebody with a felony, it's just the consequences of that are just significant. So just kind of to draw a picture, it's like you get arrested, you're going to go to jail. If you're being charged with a felony, there's a bail schedule that corresponds with your offense. Most people can't afford that bail. So you're going to stay in jail until your case is resolved. And this time it means that you're going to be exposed to COVID and it could very well be a death sentence. Um, and then in the time that you're incarcerated, you're going to lose your job because nobody's going to keep you employed if you don't come up, 
if you don't show up to work. Um, you may you may lose your car if you have a car because it's going to be in the street, you know, for a couple of days. Uh, you may lose custody of your children. Um, and by the time you resolve your case, if you end up pleading guilty to a felony, you now have new barriers to getting, uh, you know, to be able to rent a house for yourself, to get a job because you have to, that felony record is going to follow you. Um, and, you know, you're going to have, you know, you're going to have a hard time, if at all, uh, trying to get a license to do any kind of uh, a job that requires a license. Um, so there's lifelong consequences to, to, you know, to felony convictions and felony charges. Um, if you're not a citizen, you could very well be deported or you may have, you know, a lot of problems with trying to get your green card, even if it's not a deportable offense. Um, and that, that's what they're trying to do is that they're trying to be, they're wanting to hang all those consequences over people's heads by making those low level petty offenses that could easily be resolved, at, you know, through diversion, right, without even arrests being necessary. Um, and, you know, they're able to, they're trying to get more power uh, to the state and to hold those consequences over poor people and people of color. Um, and, and that's what's disturbing about all of it. Absolutely. This is very uh, concerning for me and just thinking through how easily um, and just based on misinformation uh, that our DAs, and prosecutors are trying to roll back um, the gains we made through 57 and 47. And so, um, and I just wanna tell our folks like, don't think the prosecution is all of a sudden gonna go easy on any offenses that happen in Alameda County um, because I just haven't seen it. Um, and even in other counties, I just haven't seen it and where there's, times where the prosecution or the DA will seek a harsher charge um, or an extended um, number of years. And so this, this policy could easily roll us back to this kind of a, you know, steal a loaf of bread and to suffer these really major consequences. And so, and just to kind of put things in perspective, um, for me, what this really rings is about the, the youth. Um, and so our youth sometimes engage in behaviors that um, that as part of a learning process and, and things like teenage rebellion. And so perhaps to have something very small, like a petty theft, uh, change the course of your life is, is very big. And so, um, and to put it into perspective, most iPhones and cell phones uh, cost more or are valued at more than um, $250. And so um, that's just a very small thing that can really put you behind in life. And so let's make sure that this November we don't roll back our rights. And so I really want to thank you, Yoel, for um, coming back this week and sharing with us and um, kind of being that ear on the ground for what's happening around um, what's happening around criminal justice in our county. Um, it's very much so appreciated. And so this uh, presentation will also be sent out um, to all of the attendees from both weeks and shared on our platforms. Um, and then we will also uh, put a little rundown of this information into you all's voter guides. And so I'm hoping that we can move to our closing. Thank you, Yoel, really appreciate it. And so we'll move to our closing. Um, and just want to thank everyone for participating in our second installment of From Policy to Revolution. You all are an amazing bunch. You'll receive everything in your emails, um, all of our presentations, and the recordings from these sessions in your emails. Um, please follow us, all of the wonderful organizations that make up the East Bay Anti-Displacement Collective core group. Um, follow the Brotherhood of Elders Network follow Eastside Cultural Center, follow East Oakland Collective, OCUR, and the Unity Council. Um, and if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to email us at eastbayantidisplacement at gmail.com, and we will definitely get back to you. I just want to once again thank everybody for participating. Please, please, please vote all the way down your ballot once you get it on October 5th. 
and we will be following up with you all on our post-summit activation. Thank you and have a wonderful, wonderful day.